Nicholas Meyer first came to Sherlockian attention with his international bestseller, The 7% Solution, in the 1970s. Meyer is back with a new case from Watson's journals, The Return of the Pharaoh, where Holmes journeys to Egypt in search of a missing nobleman, ends up encountering a previously undiscovered pharaoh's tomb, plus a conspiracy that threatens his very life. It's 1910. Dr. John Watson travels to Egypt with his wife, Juliet. Her tuberculosis is returned, and the doctor recommends a stay at a sanitarium in a dry climate. But while his wife undergoes treatment, Dr. Watson bumps into an old friend. That's right, Sherlock Holmes, in disguise and on a case. An English duke with a penchant for Egyptology has disappeared, leading to inquiries from his wife and the home office. Sherlock Holmes has discovered that the missing duke has indeed vanished from his lavish rooms in Cairo and that he was on the trail of a previous undiscovered and unopened tomb and that he's only the latest Egyptologist to die or disappear under odd circumstances. With the help of Howard Carter, Holmes and Watson are on the trail of something much bigger, more important, and more sinister than an errant lord. Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is brought to you by MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at MX Publishing. Dot com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And by Dan Andriaco's latest Sebastian McCabe, Jeff Cody series. The latest title, No Ghosts Need Apply, is now available. Find out more at danandriaco.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 228, The Return of the Pharaoh. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello, and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. And Burt, are you ready for the return are you, have Boy, you returned? I'm, not only am I ready for the return, I bought all my Christmas presents back in March so I could start to return them in October. That's Wow, you are a man ahead of your time. It sounds like you'll be having Unboxing Day. That's exactly right, and I'll be sleeping late on Black Friday. Fantastic. Well, man with a plan. I love it. Well, our plan here is to bring you a fantastic interview, so stay tuned for it. If you would like the show notes, and there are quite a few links that you'll want to hit, uh, it is available at ihose.co slash ihose228. That's all lowercase. That'll take you directly to ihearofsherlockeverywhere.com to this particular episode. And in doing so, you'll have the opportunity not only to click through to those links, but also to get in touch with us. You can leave us feedback on the show, either as a comment right there, or you can email us at comment at ihearofsherlock.com. You'll also want to keep that email address handy because you'll need it for later in the show when we run the canonical couplet quiz, 
We have an opportunity for you to win a copy of Nicholas Meyer's new book, The Return of the Pharaoh. And it's available to anyone who participates and whose name we correctly pick from the big spinning drum. Just a reminder, you can also support us for as little as a dollar a month. And we are getting ready to send out our annual gifts to our Patreon uh, supporters. Uh, at the $5 level, you receive a mug from I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, and there are also other levels of support as well. So we ask you to take a look at what works for you and see if you can support the show. We do appreciate it. Nicholas Meyer is an award-winning author, screenwriter, and director. His body of creative work in publishing, film, and television spans more than five decades. He's the author of seven previous novels, including four about Sherlock Holmes, The 7% Solution, The West End Horror, The Canary Trainer, and The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. Meyer made his directing debut in 1979 with a film he wrote, Time After Time, starring Malcolm McDowell, Mary Steenburgen, and David Warner. He went on to direct Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, widely considered to be the best of the Star Trek cinema canon. Meyer directed ABC's The Day After in 1983, which remains the single most watched television film ever made. 100 million people watched it in one night. It was nominated for 14 Emmys. Additional work includes a two-part miniseries, Houdini, starring Adrian Brody, based on his father, Bernard C. Meyer's biography. He's the co-creator of the Netflix series Medici, Masters of Florence, starring Dustin Hoffman, and worked on Star Trek Discovery for CBS Access. Born and raised in New York City, Nicholas Meyer graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in theater and filmmaking. He lives in Santa Monica, California. Nick Meyer, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to return to work in the title of my book uh, the return yeah very good well uh you you were with us first on episode 85 where we kind of did a, a full summation of your career uh, up until that point and then you joined us again just a couple of years ago to talk about uh, peculiar protocols what's interesting to me is that there was such a gap between your first success you had well interestingly you had the seven percent solution followed on quickly by the West End Horror, one after the other. And then there was a gap of, oh gosh, almost 20 years before uh, the notorious Canary Trainer came along. And now again, you've got a quick succession of books after another long hiatus there from 93 to 2019. What do you think causes these spurts of creativity one after the other, the way you had in the beginning of your Sherlock Holmes career, if I can call it that, and now in uh, in these later years. You make me sound like a redwood tree with all those rings, uh, you know, where you are in different dates, 1066, the Norman Conquest. Um, well, the the overarching answer is that I don't write a Sherlock Holmes novel unless two things are present. One is that I have the time to do it. And the other is that I have an idea that's so irresistible uh, that it won't let go. Uh, and I'm not very big on getting ideas. Most of my ideas stink, so they sort of die a warning. And I go, oh, that's not really good. Head a gabbler in outer space? I don't think so. Uh, so, and the third, you know, variable is, will somebody pay me money to do it? You know, Dr. Johnson said, a man is a blockhead who writes for any other reason but money. When I wrote the 7% solution, it did not occur to me. I thought this book is saleable. This is, this is publishable. Friends read it and said, you could publish this. And that's what I hoped for. It did not occur to me that it would become the number one best-selling novel in the United States for 40 weeks and whatever. Um, and it did not occur to me that E.P. Dutton, my publisher and my beloved 
late editor, Yuri Jojevics, would say, we want another one. Um, and, you know, and, and they, they offered me, you know, money if I would write another one. So uh, that was a great stimulus. And I wrote The West End Horror, which, in, you know, artists are not the best judges of their own work, to put it mildly. Um, but that's sort of the purest Conan Doyle adventure in my oeuvre. Uh, and, and then, as you say, there was a, an enormous uh, gap. I didn't realize it was 20 years um, before I wrote The Canary Trainer. And I, I wrote The Canary Trainer because I was standing in a bookstore in, in Marylebone Road in London, where I was living at the time. And I stumbled on a copy of the Gaston Leroux novel, The Phantom of the Opera. And I wrote, oh, this is a book. All right, who knew? And I started standing there thumbing and I'm reading the introduction. And in the introduction, somebody said, how come Sherlock Holmes never met The Phantom of the Opera? And like I stood there with the hairs on the back of my neck going statically aloft, going, oh, my God, is anybody watching? Um you know, and, and then sort of scurrying out with the book and, you know, thought, you know, I, I think it was Victor Hugo said there's nothing so irresistible as an idea whose time has arrived. And I was uh, totally jazzed to write this. It was an idea that wouldn't let go, which is, as I say, rare for me. Um, and then I was very busy for the next 26 years. Well, I don't know if it was Star Trek or two Philip Roth novels or the day. I had no idea, but I was a busy kid. Um, and then I found myself, uh, I've always been interested in forgery. Maybe because I am a forger. I forge Doyle or Watson manuscripts. Take your pick. Forgery is an interesting topic, and I have collected sort of behind me over there somewhere, quite a library devoted to forgery. And it isn't long when you're interested in forgery before you come across the biggest, baddest forgery of all time, which is the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And that thing was rattling around in my head for 10 years. I was thinking of Sherlock tackling the protocols of the learned elders of Zion for 10 years. And then a professor, Stephen Zipperstein, uh, who is at uh, Stanford, I believe, wrote a book called Pogrom. And my agent, who happened to be his agent, sent me that book. And between that book and a graphic novel by Will Eisner called The Plot, which is about the protocols. That sort of pushed me into the starting gate, and that became an idea that wouldn't let go. Um, and so that was the that was the protocols of the, the the adventure of the peculiar protocol. And then um, this last book. The Return of the Pharaoh, or I should say the most recent book. Let's not say the last book. Let's be more optimistic. Um, <laughs> the most, most recent book was suggested to me by my longtime agent, friend, manager, everything, My who said, why don't you put Holmes in Egypt? And all kinds of light bulbs immediately went off. Why? Why? Um, First of all, ever since I was a kid and watched all those spear and sandal movies with names like Land of the Pharaohs and the Valley of the Kings. And I I'm from New York. I would go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art all the time. And they had a whole Egyptian. They have a whole Egyptian wing, the temple at Dendur. And there's mummies and you wander around. And then I watched all those uh, universal horror movies, you know, the curse of the mummy, the return of the mummy. The, um and so I was fascinated by all things Egyptian, not just even Egyptian. I very early on uh, learned about Heinrich Schliemann, the discoverer of Troy. And the first screenplay I ever wrote, for which I know the world was crying out, 
was the life of Heinrich Schliemann, the guy who discovered Troy. Schliemann was a kind of sloppy archaeologist, to put it mildly. But if he has a claim to fame, and I, I think he probably does, um, he was arguably the first person to run with the idea. Maybe other people had the idea, but this guy ran with it. That legends may very well have their origins in some kind of fact. And he thought maybe the Iliad is not just a made up story. Maybe there is such a place. Um, so yes, I was always interested in archaeology. I've always been interested in Sherlock Holmes and the dates kind of worked out. So when Alan Gasmer suggested Holmes in Egypt, I thought, oh, my God, yeah, there's an idea that won't let go. And I hope I've explained the my erratic, my erratic Holmes oeuvre, my production. Yeah, no. And I... what's weird is that I have an idea for another one. And if my book, which is which never happens, I don't get my own ideas. I, I find other people. So if this one, if this book sells well, maybe Minotaur books and their infinite wisdom will, will commission the one I've got on the back burner. Well, if that isn't the greatest sales pitch I've ever heard, you know, for, for people, for people to get the sequel, you're going to have to go out and buy this one in droves. So let's get out there, people. Um, you know, it strikes me, Nick, that, I mean, your, your interests are obviously, uh, what drive you here, your initial interest in Sherlock Holmes back in the early 1970s, your interest in forgery, your interest in Egyptology in recent years. And at the same time, these interests almost perfectly dovetail with larger things that happen to be going on in society at the time. So in other words, Sherlock Holmes in the early to mid 1970s, the 7% solution was really frankly dealing with Holmes's drug problem. Okay. Correct. We went to Vienna to see Sigmund Freud. You know, we all know the story and we're coming off of, you know, the late sixties, the early seventies where drugs are becoming more mainstream in culture and society. They are certainly becoming more talked about today. In 2021, we've begun to see this turn against some of the empires that went in and did the, the, the grab and go, uh, archaeology. You know, the British Museum is under fire right now. The, you know, the, the Elgin marbles, et cetera. Um, look, there are a lot of societies that have been pilfered from, uh, their antiquities have been taken by some of these conquerors and now they're looking to, uh, to get them back. Do you think it's repatriate them? Exactly. It was, it was explained to me recently, by the way, that the Elgin marbles that Lord Elgin actually paid for them. I, I was doing a, uh, a, a book discussion yesterday with the poison pen bookstore in Arizona and Barbara Peters, who uh, owns and runs the store was part of the discussion. And she informed me, which I didn't know that Elgin had apparently paid for the Parthenon marbles from the Greek government at the time. That is his subsequent rationale. But there is there can be no question that the return of the pharaoh touches on at least two topics of contemporary relevance. And one has to do with the whole idea of artistic ownership, if that's correct, and the and the patrimony of a given uh, country and who made off with what and what they owe as a consequence. The Getty and the Met and the British Museum have all been forced to return stolen art. Um, also, there has been a lot of looted art by the Nazis that has also, you you know, do you, I don't know if you remember the, the uh, Klimt portrait of Adele Bloch Bauer, which the Nazis helpfully retitled Portrait of a Lady in Gold and, and the lengthy lawsuit to get this back after that was stolen. Um, 
these are very thorny ethical questions, not in the case of that painting, but in certainly in the case of do we really, what's the statute of limitations on dignity and death? How long after yeah. you died before you become an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum for children to sort of gape at? Uh, and this not only goes for Egyptians, but Native Americans and, and anybody. Um, and that's one theme that certainly is running through the book. The other one, of course, is COVID. Um, Watson's wife has consumption and they have to observe certain uh, protocols of distancing and masking and so forth. So, yes, you're right. My books do seem, or at least, uh, and by the way, The West End Horror is a novel about a pandemic, although it's a years before there, we, we had the one we have now. Yeah. Now, is that is that by intention, is that by design, or is it just creeping into your subconscious? I think it's a little bit of both. I think the 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 idea that she, that uh, Juliet Watson has uh, consumption and has to go someplace for her health uh, certainly uh, tickled or pricked my imagination with the notion of of of, of COVID and certainly the the issue of of uh, stolen or plundered or looted art. You know, it may have started in the back of my mind. And then as I'm writing, it sort of works my way into the front. When I was writing what became the screenplay for Star Trek II, I was basically, which is uh, The Wrath of Khan, um, I was basically cobbling together scenes and ideas from five previous attempts to get a second Star Trek movie. I didn't know anything about Star Trek, so I was a stranger in a strange land. But as I was writing, the themes began to emerge. This is a book, of, a movie about friendship, old age, and death. And then you start writing into the themes as they kind of pop from the back burner of your consciousness into the front. Um, it's a strange process. Um, you know, it... it Edgar Allan Poe was once asked, or he said he was asked, how he wrote The Raven, his most popular poem. Do do you ever read The Philosophy of Composition by Poe? No. Edgar Allan Poe, The Philosophy of Composition. So he says, here's how I wrote The Raven for, for everybody who's interested. He said, it was simply a process of logic, nothing else. First, decision to write a poem. Okay. Second, how long should the poem be? He said, I've never written novels and I've never written epics because I believe a work of art uh, should be apprehensible at a single sitting. So he faults Milton's Paradise Lost because you can't read it in one go. Um, so I decided that my poem should be 100 lines long. Raven is like 108. Um, he said, next, what should be the subject of the poem? He said, I believe that the proper province of poetry is the province of the beautiful. Everything else is prose. So I had a hundred line poem about something beautiful. What is the greatest kind of beauty in my opinion? Sad beauty. I now had a hundred line poem about some sad kind of beauty. What is the saddest beauty I can think of? Death. Who's the saddest death I could imagine? The death of a maiden. I now had a hundred line poem about the death of a maiden. I now wanted to have a chorus or a refrain. Um, a few lines, a stanza, a sentence, maybe even a word. What's the saddest word I could think of? Nevermore. I now had a hundred line poem about the death of a maiden with this, with the refrain, nevermore. Nevermore is an answer. So somebody has to be posing questions to which the answer is always a remorseless nevermore. Uh, that was a no brainer. The lover of the dead girl. Um, and then who's answering? Ah, tricky, because never more, never more. It's like robotic. And so at first he thought of a parrot, but a parrot's a comical bird. Then he worked his way around to a raven. Ravens can imitate human speech. And now you 
have something of the perversity of the lover's psychology who's clearly framing all these questions to elicit that same respect on and on and on. This is how he says he wrote The Raven. Now, it seems to me there are a number of possibilities. One, this is how Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven. Two, this is how he thinks he wrote The Raven. Three, this is how he wishes he'd written The Raven. And four, this is how he would like you to think he wrote The Raven. Which of it, I don't know. But we tend to sort of make up things sort of after the fact to explain things. So I can I can go to the return of the Pharaoh and do something similar to how I <clears throat> got to the book, which may or may not be true. There's a reason why Plato didn't want writers in the Republic, because we're liars. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, that's so is that how you approach all of your writing projects? You just kind of. Um, you, you, you figure out a theme, you just get into it and it flows, or do you have more of the, the traditional outline and plot and, you know, you figured it all out before you sit down? No, I don't figure it all out. I don't figure it all out. I usually, it's a little bit like the way I write screenplays. I think as I was, what's the opening shot, you know, and what do you want to see next? What's the cut and so forth. Um, and I have some idea of where I want it to end. What, what, where does it end? And then the rest of it is sort of like fiddling with a Rubik's cube. Um, I find that I get a lot of ideas when I'm falling asleep or which I'm always doing, um, or when I'm waking up. Um, it used to be in California when we had water, I like to take baths and sit in the tub and think, well, I can't do that anymore. Um, but um, lest your listeners be anxious on my account, I do take showers. They're very short. Uh, anyway, um, it's like fiddling with a Rubik's cube a little bit. I walk around. Your, your listeners can't see this, but I have these, these notebooks. And it, it, it says everything from lines of dialogue to don't forget laundry and there makes no distinction on the page and i just cross off stuff i don't know if you're familiar with a wonderful pair of books by stephen sondheim who's one of my idols and he he wrote a pair of books or he assembled a pair of books called finishing the hat and look i made a hat and these are collections of his lyrics which, you know, I'm pretty familiar with, so I, that was less important to me. Then his ancillary remarks, comments, observations, uh, gripes, critiques, whatever. This is, these are invaluable books, certainly to me. And they're books that teach you how to think. And his thinking is very clear and down to earth. He is as, remorseless in critiquing himself as he is anybody else he is and i think one of the things he said that struck with me is uh if you if you're working and you suddenly feel the urge to lie down don't fight it because that's when ideas may well come and so uh, that justified all my sleeping I'm going to use that from now on, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to quote great. you to my you and Sondheim to my wife. Stick with us. We'll be back after this brief word from our sponsor. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Well, that's exactly what the Wes Express has done. Built a time machine in style to take you back to 1986 and the first issues of the Sherlock Holmes Review. Groundbreaking interviews with Jeremy Brett and Peter Cushing. Rare reprints from the Strand magazine, like A Day with Dr. Conan Doyle and a profile of William Gillette as Sherlock Holmes. 
All four issues of Volume 1, almost impossible to find today, can be yours, reprinted in a handsome 7 by 10 volume. Take a trip back to the Sherlockian fever of the 1980s. With the Sherlock Holmes Review Anthology, Volume 1, available right now at wessexpress.com. So how do you think your thinking has changed from the time when you wrote The 7% Solution to The Return of the Pharaoh? Oh, I think you've stumped me. I don't think I've been asked that question. How has my, my thinking changed? Um, I, I was tempted to say maybe I've, I've gotten bolder because I'm, I'm, I'm so ancient. Like I, I don't care what anybody thinks anymore. But in a way, I think the 7% solution was pretty bold anyway in terms of where I was going with Holmes. The thing about when I wrote the 7% solution, I'm not sure I'm addressing your question directly. Um, there were very few other Holmes novels being written. And we, we, we now have uh, pejoratively labeled these things pastiches. I, you know, then the dictionary definition of pastiche is really an homage. It, 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 it wasn't a pejorative term. Um, and I thought, well, why is it that, that this term pastiche gets this reputation? After all, isn't the Odyssey a spinoff from the Iliad? Isn't the Aeneid a spinoff from the Iliad? These are fanboy things. Michael Chabon said all fiction is fan fiction. The whole history of art. There's a history of cut and paste. Um, and suddenly when you call something a pastiche, it's it's like you're condescending to it. You're patronizing to it. Um, but when I began the 7% solution, there were not a lot of Holmes continuations being written by other people. Now there are many. I couldn't even read them all. And I, and I don't largely because I'm sufficiently insecure that I would worry that that they're better, and many of them probably are. So I just, you know, stay away, because if I was reading Holmes uh, novels, I probably wouldn't get to read anything else, like that Wagnerism book we were discussing before. Um, but I guess what I think is that if you don't push the envelope with Holmes with, with these characters, then it becomes taxidermy. You are just stuffing things that already exist. And you're saying, oh, I never used the word that Doyle didn't use. And I thought, no, I don't think so. I think you, you have to try different things. And I have perhaps become more willing to do that as I've gotten older and thinking, you know, what can they do? Send me to book jail if they don't like it. Um, and one of the tricks that I've sort of, and again, this is totally unconscious on my part, is to get him out of London, get him out of England. The West End horror is all in England, but in every other of my novels so far, Holmes is a fish out of Thames water. He is in Austria. He is in Paris. He is in Russia. And now he is in Egypt. Um, and if the next one ever got written, he'd be in another place. Uh, so I find that when he's sort of forced to uh, function without his usual resources, he comes to life, uh, at least for me. I don't know what other people think. That's fascinating. Well, maybe we can look forward to him joining Hedda Gobbler in space. Thank you. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a really interesting observation. I mean, your, your Holmes novels, four-fifths of them at least, 
are travel logs in some way. Yes, they are. And at the same time, you really since the beginning, you know, when you think about the, uh, the final scene of Holmes on top of, uh, the Orient Express, um, you know, in the sword fight, you've really captured these elements that are, are really there in the original canon that, that Conan Doyle writes about of Holmes as something of an action hero. And it's, it's gone beyond just a mystery. It's really an action and an adventure genre. Uh, this I think is true. My defense and uh, defense is the right word. I, is I always go back to Doyle. I was, I, I've never been a big fan of a lot of Sherlock Holmes movies. I find them very campy. I find Professor Moriarty a rather boring sort of comic book nemesis, the Lex Luthor of it. Um, those were not what interested me. What, what interested me were Doyle's original stories, predominantly in the Strand, not exclusively. But in those stories, we learn that Holmes has considerable athletic prowess. He is an expert single stick player. He knows the combat known as baritsu uh, of the Japanese. I guess it's some form of jujitsu. Or um, he also is a boxer. He also was an actor. These are all physical activities. So I felt that, I, or I feel that I'm well within his wheelhouse if I continue that aspect. It's not his only aspect for sure. His his he is, as he puts it, a thinking machine. Um, he's also a thinking machine with very human feelings, foibles, frailties, vanities, addictions. Um, so I try to do justice to all of it. And maybe be, because I'm fundamentally a filmmaker, I do tend to sometimes think in physical terms. Yeah. And, well, quite frankly, I think the return of the Pharaoh um, it, it harkens back to the 7% solution. It, it, it's almost written for the screen at this point, crying out <laughs> to be made it into a, into a film. It wasn't, it wasn't consciously written for the screen, but, but the cinematic sensibility of the author may, as, as I say, writing these books is, I mean, to, not a hobby, but it, it's, it's it's not what I normally do, uh, and I have to find time and and space to do it. But I do, you know, I've have grown up writing, thinking, and making movies. Um, so perhaps I I do. But the other thing that I think has influenced me enormously was the adventure novels that I read that are set in the Victorian era. Whether we are talking about um, King Solomon's Mines, whether we are talking about Treasure Island, whether we are talking about the prisoner of Zenda, one of whose characters actually appears in the 7% solution. They bump into Rudolf Rassendel on a train. Also, I love trains. I just love trains. And I, whether we're talking about the lady vanishes or strangers on a train, um, or North by Northwest, all these Hitchcock train movies, um, they're romantic, they're atmospheric, they're scenic. So, yes, they, it's both the 7% solution and I think, um, the return of the Pharaoh have big scenes on trains in them. It can't be a coincidence that when we first meet Holmes in the novel, his alias is Colonel Arbuthnot. Yeah, I just grabbed the name and then I realized later it was from Murder on the Orient Express. Or I, I guess it was originally titled Murder in the Calais Coach. I just like the name. Well, it, it certainly I fits with the theme. So I thought I would yeah. write it. Um, you know, speaking of, of, of movies, I mean, we've had a, a real glut of Sherlock Holmes in the last 10 years. And, and these things tend to go in cycles, you know, and I, I think it's, we, we've talked about this before. It was your 
uh, novel, The 7% Solution in the 70s, that really caused a resurgence of sorts. Um, do you think, in, in hearkening back to Victor Hugo, do you think the time would be right for the return of Pharaoh to be considered as a film or should it be kind of held in a, in a tomb somewhere and then unearthed in the future? Oh, wow. Is that what we call a trick question? <laughs> Take it as you uh, will. Um, because I mean, obviously for my own purposes, I would love to see it be made into a movie. I think it would be a good movie. I think there's reasons to enjoy it. It's, you know, it's an idea whose, whose time, at least in my own head, has arrived. On the other hand, there's an awful lot of Sherlock Holmes stuff out there, whether you like all, all of it or not, is another issue entirely. You know, speaking for myself, sure, make it into a movie. I, will, I'll, I would love to write the screenplay. But does that mean the time is ripe for it? I, I cannot be any kind of objective judge. That's for uh, for the Hollywood moguls to figure out, I would imagine. Both of them. <laughs> you know, it seems to me, in addition, obviously, to taking Doyle's character and expanding on him, there are uh, homages to Doyle himself in this book. I mean, certainly you have Watson's wife, who is suffering from consumption, just like Conan Doyle's first wife was. He took her away um, to, to Switzerland, uh, you know, where he got some ideas himself. Um, there's, there's also, um, you know, the, this very notion of Egyptology being on the rise, uh, Conan Doyle's short story, lot 249, lot number 249, that, that was the inspiration for the mummy. Um, I didn't, I didn't know that. I don't know that I've read that, that short story. I thought also, and I also recently learned, I forgot when I was writing about Juliet Watson with consumption. I forgot that Louise Doyle, known as Tui, um, that he had taken her not only to Switzerland, but I also think Egypt. I think they also went to Egypt. And I, I had completely, on a conscious level, blotted that out. Um, he also um, wrote a book called The Stark Monroe Letters. Um, and I think I appropriated that name, added a hyphen. Uh, so, yeah, there are nods to Doyle, whether they are conscious or unconscious or a bit of both in the book and in the books. And there should be, in my opinion. He's he's the creator. Yeah. Well, I think any any dedicated Sherlockian, certainly any dedicated Doylean, uh, would be able to, to pick up on those. Um, when it comes to Egyptology, you know, this, this was a, a kind of a craze that hit, uh, the Western world in the early 1900s, 1910 to 1920, certainly. The, the, the setting for the return of the Pharaoh is really the, the decade that leads up to the discovery of uh, Tutankhamun's uh, tomb in 1922. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what was going on in society at the time and why this craze uh, was uh, such a craze? Well, I'm not a, this will surprise you, a total expert about this stuff, but I do know that uh, because of European winters um, and because of looking for dry climates because of the prevalence of things like consumption, a lot of well-to-do or people who had enough money uh, started flocking to places like Egypt, North Africa, uh, Morocco, uh, in order to make use of that dry climate. And some of them went there for more ne nefarious purposes, sort of sexual purposes. I think that Flaubert and Camille Sanson like to go to Egypt for their own 
particular reasons that had nothing to do with climate. But once they got there, they were introduced and influenced by other things. The, the ancient, the culture of ancient Egypt itself, the exoticism of it. Camille Sanson particularly, for example, wrote his fifth piano concerto, is known as the Egyptian. It was a tune that he heard on a houseboat on the on the Nile that that was worked into the to the piece. He also wrote a symphonic suite called Africa. He also wrote his big opera Samson and Delilah. These are all sort of biblical things. Flaubert, who's most famous for Madame Bovary, but he wrote a lot of sort of historical epics set in Carthage and with titles like Salambo and. And I don't think many people read them, but yes. And people like Lord Carnarvon, who was, I believe, injured in a motorcycle, a, 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 a car crash, and was told to go to Egypt to recuperate. And once there, they became immersed in this Egyptomania, looking for buried treasure, um, which was lying all around if you discounted all the clever forgeries made by the clever natives uh the egyptians who said wow they you know they want egyptian antiques we can make those um and so there was like a whole crazy business in all that stuff uh and this goes back to the beginning of our conversation about european countries or or united states making off with, you know, in the Metropolitan Museum, they've got the whole Temple of Dendor, which was, you know, disassembled piece by piece and reassembled on Fifth Avenue. So, yeah, there was a lot of um, acquisition. Yeah, and when you think about it, the the locale, the era, it was really kind of designed for adventure and romance, and so much uh, came out of that. I mean, you think about uh, Death on the Nile. You think about uh, the Indiana Jones uh, films. I mean, these are all kind of set in North Africa and with that same mentality, that adventure mentality. And by the time Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered, I mean, it, it was it was literally like a needle in a haystack because you had what? 1500 generations of Egyptians and pirates and thieves that had already gone through everything. Everything, everything had been uh, robbed, explored, looted. When I was in Egypt in 1979, I went into the Great Pyramid through the robber's entrance, which is an exercise not for the faint of heart, um, I can tell you, um, because it's very tiny and you can't back down. And you're crawling at a steep angle about half the height of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, so it's a, um, it's an interesting exercise. Uh, it also occurs to me while we're talking about this sort of Egyptomania is that painters were fascinated, particularly a painter who's no longer in fashion. The impressionists and their successors kind of drove him into a, uh, you know, over a half century of obscurity, but he may be coming back, who name, whose name was Jean-Léon Jérôme, with a G, Jérôme. They were called Orientalists. And these were painters who really romanticized uh, and exoticized the Egypt and the North Africa that they found. Um, critics later accused them of a kind of... Um, Egypto porn, you know, the slave market um, with naked ladies and and uh, and and the carpet. You can look up Jerome, G E R O M E, and look at his images, and you'll see. Um, and he was later, as I say, uh, criticized and ostracized for not only his style of painting, but the sort of what what was considered to be the colonial uh, aspects 
uh, of the of its content, how it how it depicted and pandered to certain you know Western tastes for you know the exotic, the forbidden, the taboo um, stuff, and that was another part of I think what drew other people from Europe and the United States to visit in search of that stuff. Some of which I'm sure they found. We're going to pause here a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. You've heard them on here before, and now they are back. It is the Sebastian McCabe Jeff Cody Mystery Series by Dan Andriaco. You've heard of the novels No Police Like Holmes, Holmes Sweet Holmes, the 1895 murder and more well they're back on september 28th with the latest title no ghosts need apply sherlock holmes of course said to dr watson the world is big enough for us no ghosts need apply but mccabe and cody well they don't have a choice when a popular reality tv show comes to their native erin ohio to record a Halloween special about some entity that's disturbing the local gastropub known as the Speakeasy. What was expected to be some fun publicity for the pub turns into a nightmare after someone is shot to death one night in the same place and in the same way as Jackie O'Brien almost 100 years earlier. The police chief recognizes this is Mac and Jeff's kind of case, but they're forced to become virtual sleuths for most of the time when the restaurant and most businesses are shut down because of COVID. Before he solves the murder and a second homicide, Mac makes an embarrassing blunder in one lesser case and scores a great triumph in another. Make sure you check out No Ghosts Need Apply by Dan Andriaco at danandriaco.com today. Well, this is, this is fascinating. I mean, it's all part of the backdrop of The Return of the Pharaoh, which is available now from Minotaur Books, available wherever books are sold. Uh, and of or course, heard. or heard. Yes, that, that, Actually, that, that's a great final uh, segue here. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your selection, how you arrived at the narrator for the audio version of the book, and who it is. I don't listen to a lot of audio books, but one of the things that I'm I'm very concerned with, and I'm always concerned with it as a filmmaker, is voices, how people sound. When I was a kid and watched the John Huston version of Moby Dick, where Richard Basehart uh, narrates with uh, as Ishmael, that was so solidly right that that I can't read Moby Dick without hearing Richard Basehart's voice. And that's the voice I want to hear. But God help you if you're listening to the wrong voice. It can wreck the book. It can ruin the book. So I, I was very persnickety about who was going to narrate the adventure of the peculiar protocols. And after giving the matter some serious thought, I settled on my actor friend, David Robb, R-O-B-B, who I think first came to real public notice as a young and extremely handsome youth in I, Claudius. He plays Germanicus. And later I directed him with Pierce Brosnan in the Merchant Ivory film, The Deceivers in India. That's where we became friends. And more recently, he's played the doctor in Downton Abbey. Uh, and he had the old fashioned English accent that I wanted. I didn't want people sounding like what I call Euro trash, Tony Blair, John Major, Maggie Thatcher. It is, it, it isn't. It's a, it's a, that's a modern, I don't know what it is, but it's very grating and it doesn't sound like Watson to me. And David did sound like Watson. I said, this is the guy who's going to do this. And I've been to both recording sessions for both books just to make sure that 
because I narrated my own memoir a couple of years ago, um, which is called The View from the Bridge, Memories of Star Trek and a Life in Hollywood. And what I found is that when you go to narrate these books, there's no director. No one is minding the store. There's an engineer who's sitting in the next booth or outside the booth and making sure that you say every word. But no one's telling you how you're doing or whether you're doing it, you could do it differently. So I, I've attended all the recording sessions of my books that I, certainly the last two, uh, with David, because then I thought I would get it reasonably right. And I and I think I did. Um, I think he's an excellent Watson. I wouldn't mind seeing him as Watson in the movies, because I think he'd be a very good one. Yeah, he looks like a great Watson. As a matter of fact, we did a write-up a couple of years ago on the on the website. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Where we said, well, if we were casting Holmes and Watson in his last bow, which of course is set in 1914, just before the opening of the Great War, who would we cast as Holmes and Watson? We chose uh, Daniel Day Lewis for Holmes and David Robb for Watson. So you have excellent taste. Validated my choice. Yes, must have must have been subconscious on our part. Well. Nicholas Meyer, it's always a pleasure. Uh, you know, if anything today, in, in addition to all of the wonderful things you've shared about the creative process, about Egypt and the like, I think we've taken away two really important, uh, points. And that is one, we're so lucky that the raven wasn't accidentally called the parrot and the Odyssey very well could have been called the Iliad Two Electric Boogaloo. So, if anything, we're grateful. Absolutely worth it. If you like the book, write a reader's report. That's all I can say. Oh, that's a great point. Anytime you can write a review for books that you've read, but particularly this one, buy it, read it, review it. That helps the sales of the book. It helps uh, how it's ranked. And that means it'll help Nick Meyer write the sequel or the follow-up novel to this one. Nick, thanks so much. Scott, thank you so much. Thanks for finding the time, making the time. Well, you know, Bert, it was that was an amazing interview. I mean, it's always uh, amazing to talk to Nicholas Meyer. He is a raconteur extraordinaire. Uh, we didn't go quite as long as we did with the first episode because that was really catching us up on about 40 years worth of his work. <laughs> so that's good. But I was so disappointed that you weren't able to join me for the interview. Oh, boy. No one was more disappointed than I am. I love talking to Nick. It, for so many reasons, but I was unfortunately away for the weekend up at the 50th anniversary of the Cornish Arms. But Nick, you know, when you talk to Nick Meyer, I mean, there are people who've been writing pastiches about Sherlock Holmes since the 1890s. Uh, but when you talk to Nick Meyer, the 7% solution, that grand continuation of the tra tradition, why it almost moves seamlessly from the sign of four into the 7% solution. And his, and his other... Uh, Holmes pastiches, you know, and everything else he's accomplished in the arts and film and directing with Star Trek. Um, you know, there's just nobody like Nick Meyer, and I just value the opportunity to catch up with him. And it's it's so great that this book is um, is out now. It is, and it, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I know he is looking for uh, reviews of the book on Amazon from people who have read it. And uh, that, in turn, may help his editors and his publishers decide to go with the next book in the series. Uh, he says he already has an idea, so we'll see if he is able to bring that idea to the public's eye. Yeah, well, that's exciting. As we're getting near the holiday season, you know our friends from MX Publishing have all kinds of books to offer. However, the last order date to get your books in time for the holidays was October 31st. So if by chance you miss this deadline, just know two things. One, you can certainly get all of MX Publishing's titles from other sites like Amazon and Barnes & Noble. 
But even more interesting, there are audiobook collections available from MX Publishing. So you can get your books delivered electronically and still enjoy them in time for the holidays. You've got titles such as Memoirs from Mrs. Hudson's Kitchen by Wendy Heyman Marsaw, Sherlock Holmes and the Cornwall Affair by Johanna Reiki, Sherlock and Irene by Chris Chan, and many, many more titles there available for you if you like to have some entertainment between your ears. And as a listener of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, we are sure that you do. So just get on over to mxpublishing.com and check out the audiobook collections today. That theme music can only mean one thing. It is time once again for everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show, that's right, it's Canonical Couplet, where we give you two lines of poetry and you give us the name of the Sherlock Holmes story that we were inferring. If you were around here the last episode, you'll recall that we gave you this clue. The housekeeper was little, dark, and looked with sidelong eyes. Sulky, guilty knowledge marked defiance in her eyes. Bert, I hesitate to ask, but do you know the answer no. to this canonical couplet? No, no, I've got this. This is a great story. It's about the missing rugby player who's also a vegetarian. It's the story Watson called The Missing Tree Hugger. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Uh, no, no, not even close. Although we did cover vegetarian restaurants in Trifles, our other uh, Sherlockian podcast. But, as usual, you are... Way, way off the mark. Mm. Um, and, well, the good news is you have company. Eric Deckers is once again <laughs> joining you on uh, this ship that is perpetually going down. He says, I've got it. I've got it. This week's canonical couplet is about the infamous Dutch counterfeiter Bert, <laughs> Bert von Volder, who tried, <laughs> who tried to create fake Dutch money but was undone by a small misprint on the coins. It's the story of the no good gilder. <laughs> <laughs> Except, Eric writes, now that I hear it out loud, that seems unlikely. It's more likely to be the Norwood builder. Well, that, oh. that is correct, Eric. And I'm glad you came to your senses after uh, evidently dashing your head against the door jam. <laughs> there. Um, well, we have a number of people who also submitted the Norwood Builder as the correct answer. Of course, uh, referring to Jonas Oldacre's housekeeper there. Do you remember her name, Bert? Jonas yes. Jonas Oldacre's housekeeper. Yes, I do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's great, and I'm not going to I'm not going to embarrass you by asking the obvious follow up question. <laughs> well, the obvious follow up question is what was the name of the groundskeeper, and I have no idea. Groundskeeper Willie. <laughs> no. Uh, well, let's see who else uh, was able to answer this correctly and pick our winner as we bring out the big prize wheel and give it a spin. All right, it's slowing down. Landing on number 82, number 82, and that is Andy Gage. Andy, congratulations. We will have a copy of, oh, no, not a copy of, it is something from the uh, iHost Collectibles uh, collection, something from our vaults. Not something that is from Glenn's collection. Of course, last episode we talked about uh, 221 objects, Sherlock Holmes and 221 objects with Glenn Maranker. Uh, we have not been able to secure something from his collection. So uh, sadly, Andy, you get something from ours. He's so possessive. I know. Well, yeah. what can you do? What can you do? Well, in this case, we have another canonical couplet for this episode. And recall, this is for a copy of Nicholas Meyer's The Return of the Pharaoh. Here it is. 
a client from the country. That was plain to see. How could he know his fate was sealed at the Queen's Jubilee? If you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com and put canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose you at random, you'll win. Good luck. You know, if Nick's current book is The Return of the Pharaoh, Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if his idea for the next one has got something to do with quinoa. Quinoa. Yeah. I've lo- you've lost me on this one, Bert. <laughs> Pharaoh. Oh. Pharaoh quinoa. <laughs> oh my god. We better stop this episode before it gets out of control. More you've, you've, out of control. You clear you clearly need, you know, more education, involvement, and engagement in in grains and in <laughs> <laughs> and in a number of things in this sort of culinary uh, coulisse here off in the corner. Yeah, well, it is with a grain of salt that I take all of these <laughs> interactions. I must, I must. Well, we will be back at the end of the month on uh, November 30th with another interview with another author. Who will it be? What will the book be? Well, you'll have to stay tuned to find out. Make sure you're subscribed to us on whatever podcast player is your preference, and be sure to support us on Patreon. In the meantime, this is the always returning Scott Monty. (laughs) And this is inevitably boomeranging Burt Walder. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) boomerang. Well, and that means together we say... Roughly simultaneously, we say... The games of foot. (laughs) The The games of foot. I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes.